So we've covered SN2, we've covered E2. Now it's time to talk, tackle something, a little something called SN1. And it's kind of like SN2, it's still gonna be a substitution reaction. Yeah. So let me give you uh, an example and show you the mechanism and then we'll kind of tackle what you look for when you see SN1 and how you go about it. Okay, so let's say I gave you guys, we start out with isopropyl bromide, right? Again, flashing our uh, amazing common naming skills. And then let's just say I had an arrow and we were just in surrounded by water. And remember what kind of solvent water is. Water is a polar protic solvent. So here's kind of what's going to happen. Water being polar protic, and this bromine, remember, this bond right here between this carbon and this bromine, remember, there's a delta minus on the bromine and there's a delta plus on the carbon. Okay, knowing that, here's what's going to happen. All of these hydrogens in water, a lot of water molecules, because remember, we're, we're, if we're in a solution, right, if we're in an aqueous environment, aqueous meaning water, there's tons of water molecules, right? Well, a bunch of water molecules are going to align themselves right next to that negative bromine. Because remember, these hydrogens in the water molecules have a partially positive, partial, a partial positive charge. So they're attracted to the partial negative of bromine. And here's what's going to happen. Bromine's going to eventually just be like, okay, I'm coming with you guys. And he's actually just going to leave. And this bond is just going to break. And when you have some leaving group, remember bromine is a good leaving group. If you have some leaving group kind of weaned off and it leaves due to the solvent help kind of pulling it off, this is something called solvolysis. It's like the solvent, right, kind of broke, lysis, this bond, right? So if you think about it, we have a Br minus. I'm going to draw the result of that. Remember, Br minus is stable. That's a good thing. We're okay with that. But here's what we're left over with. Right? Our three carbon chain. But remember, this carbon that I'm going to dot right here, he lost a bond. So he's going to have a positive charge. Because remember, he has a hydrogen right here. So if I draw that hydrogen in, he only has three bonds. He has a plus one formal charge. This is what we call, I think I mentioned this before, a carbocation. And that makes sense, right? Because remember from your Gen Chem days, you'd have anions and cations. So this is just a carbon cation, a carbocation, right? Kind of a cool word right there. Okay, so some things about carbocations. There's three bonding areas, right? One, two, three. So they are sp2 hybridized, which means they are flat aka trigonal planar, right? Okay, so now that we have this positive charge, I'm going to tell you right now, carbocations, extremely reactive. You don't stick around like this forever, okay? We need something to attack, right? And what's the most abundant nucleophile we have around? Well, it's actually our solvent, right? It's actually water. So here's what happens. You have water laying around, because there's a ton of it, right? And what he's going to do is he's going to take his two electrons and he's going to come in and attack this carbon right there, okay? And here's kind of the result of that electron flow. We don't need to break any bonds, right? Because this carbon doesn't have a... He, he has three bonds. He's totally okay accepting a fourth. He's an electrophile, right? Because he's positive looking for something negative like this partially, posit or partially negative oxygen. Here's what we got going on. I added H2O, and if we reevaluate oxygen's formal charge, because we just donated uh, an electron pair, he's in control of one, two, three, four, five, so he actually has a positive one formal charge. And he doesn't like to stick around like that. So actually, this Br- is going to come back and help us, because he's going to grab a hydrogen off of this oxygen. I'm going to grab the H+, plus. I'm going to dump these electrons on oxygen, and if I draw my arrow down, here's kind of what we're left with. We are now left with 
isopropyl alcohol, okay, and HBr. But don't worry too much about the HBr, we're not really interested in that. We just performed an SN1 reaction, because here's what happened, right? We started off with this isopropyl bromide with a partial negative on the bromine and a partial positive on the carbon attached to it, our substrate carbon. Our polar product solvent helped wean the bromine off and through solvolysis, he left. After the brom bromine left and it was Br- minus on its own, we have this secondary, right, because this carbon is secondary, then we have this secondary carbocation, right? They're reactive, they want to be attacked, they want, an extra, they want to have four bonds, carbocation. The most prevalent nucleophile we had was actually our solvent. Water came in and attacked, didn't have to break any bonds, because we only had three bonds to begin with, right? And then we had a little bit of a cleanup step, and you'll be doing this so much in OCHEM, cleanup step. We had something floating around, grab a hydrogen, or a, a proton, dump electrons on oxygen, and we had our final product here. Okay, let me erase this, and then we'll kind of go over the rules of what you look for in an SN1 reaction, and then we'll move on to E1, and then we'll call it a wrap. Okay, gang, so now that we kind of saw how the mechanism flows, and don't worry, I'll draw it again for you, don't worry, uh, let's go over kind of those bullet points that we've been doing for SN2 and E2, things to kind of look out for, a little checklist as far as, you know, identifying and confirming that we have an SN1 reaction. Okay, so the biggest tip-off, at least thus far, is that you will probably, you will see a polar protic solvent. So remember, in SN2 and E2, we were using a polar A protic solvent. Because remember, if we had a polar protic solvent, our, um, our nucleophile gets trapped, right? You saw that through solvolysis. But remember, with our polar protic solvent, right, if we had the same situation we just kind of handled, right, we need that partially positive uh, hydrogen, that protic aspect of the solvent to help wean off our leaving group to then form our carbocation, okay? So the next thing, actually, let me leave this up. The next thing we look for is a weak nucleophile and a weak base. It kind of has to be both, right? Because if we have a, a strong nucleophile, we might try to actually do SN2, right? On the same token, if we have a weak base, you know, we could do elimination. We need something that wants to do substitution, but is kind of a little weak. It's not as reactive as, say, maybe, you know, <clears throat> a hydroxide. Instead, remember, we just used water. And the reason why OH- would either go for a straight-up SN2, or if we were hysterically encumbered enough, he would try to do elimination. On the other hand, water is less reactive. And the only way water gets to actually react in the substitution reaction in SN1 is because, remember, when we form that carbocation, this species is very reactive. Reactive enough to make water a good nucleophile. Okay, and then here's the last point. You're looking for either a secondary or a tertiary substrate. So, and I'll explain why. The carbon that you form as a carbocation, you will only form secondary and tertiary carbocations, and here's why. It's kind of like how we talked with radicals, right? Remember hy hyperconjugation? The, the more your degree goes up, the more stable you are as not only a radical, but a carbocation. Because of that same fleeting interaction where parallel, uh, orbitals align and you mimic a pi bond. So just know that a primary carbocation is less stable than a secondary carbocation, which is less stable than a tertiary carbocation. But I'm going to tell you right now, you will only be forming secondary and tertiary carbocations, okay? So these are kind of your checklists. So let me erase this. We'll do a few, two examples, and then we'll do a small video on E1, and then we're, we're done with substitution and elimination. Okay, gang, so let's do two examples of SN1 reactions. So let me first throw this one up for you. Because I want to highlight 
a little bit of stereochemistry and how it plays in here. Okay, so we have this structure right here and we have methanol. So let's first look, here's our, let's identify our substrate, but you can see that our solvent is polar protic, right? Because we're definitely polar and we have an oxygen bonded to a hydrogen. There's a big delta plus on that hydrogen. Okay, so let's actually draw the mechanism. So first step is that iodine through solvolysis will leave. And you don't have to draw the solvent around the leaving group like I did. You can kind of just draw an arrow and write solvolysis. And then you can just show your leaving group leaving, doing what it does best, okay? And that means this dot carbon right here is our carbocation. And that's good, right? Because he's tertiary. He's a relatively stable carbocation, right? And I can draw our I minus that we kicked off down here, but we won't really need him. Okay, so now's the point where we attack, and we indeed, so we have a polar product solvent, we have a tertiary substrate, and our nucleophile is, you know, not a great base, and it's definitely not extremely strong. He's not negatively charged, he's not a good base, he's perfect for an SN1 reaction. So let me draw methanol. Here's what's going to happen. He's going to attack, and it doesn't matter where you draw the arrow, I just happen to draw it to avoid my, my positive formal charge, and then draw the result. So I have an oxygen, direct. the oxygen is the one with the lone pairs, he's directly attacking, right? Double-headed arrow because we're moving two electrons. I have a hydrogen bonded up here, and a CH3 over here, and if you evaluate oxygen's formal charge, you'll see it is a plus one, okay? Here's where iodine comes back in. We're gonna grab a proton off of the oxygen to make him happy by dumping electrons on him and eliminating that formal charge. So let me put the final product down here. I'm just gonna draw the OCH3. I'm not gonna draw the HI, okay? So here's something I want to raise a thought to you guys. When we attack this carbocation intermediate here with the methanol, what's the stereochemistry? Do we go, well, we don't have a stereo center, but do we attack from above or below the carbocation? And that's kind of a trick question, because remember, we said carbocations are flat. So if I'm going to kind of draw this with some perspective, What actually happens, I'll draw this in red, is that the methanol, draw him over here, the methanol actually attacks above and it attacks below. There's no preference, right? And if we do have a stereo center, you would get a 50%, 50% mixture between a wedge and a dash from whatever your nucleophile is when you attack a carbocation. And I don't know if I mentioned this word or not, but that type of mixture is called a racemic mixture because you have 50% of a wedge and a dash kind of at that stereo center. You have 50% an antimer, 50% the other an antimer. Okay? So whenever you attack a carbocation, remember, it's trigonal planar, it's flat. You can attack on top or you can attack below. There's no preference from your nucleophile and that gives you a racemic mixture which is 50% one enantiomer, 50% the other enantiomer. 